Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. It's Croctober, the official celebration of Crocs fans like you. So whether you like to rock your classic clogs, get cozy and fuss lined personalize with your favorite gibbets charms, or even, you know, dress up like a clog for Halloween, it's time to tell your story and share your style. Join the Croctober celebration with Crocs fans around the world. Go to crocs.com to discover the range of shoes and find a pair that's iconic like you. Crocs, celebrating you all month long. This is the sound of your ride home with dad after he caught you vaping. Awkward, isn't it? Most vapes contain seriously addictive levels of nicotine and disappointment. Know the real cost of vapes. Brought to you by the FDA. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown. You weren't recording what I just said, were you? No, I okay. definitely was not because it was extremely crass and rude. <laughs> uh, Mike's all flustered. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. <laughs> and yeah, that's Matthew Stockton down there in Vancouver. How is Steve? I am more than concerned about our little friend. Steve has his little uh, cone on, and by the end of the day, it's like a dirty martini because there's so much <laughs> slobber in that thing, which oh, is no. disgusting. But he's he's also happily on morphine, so he just kind of languishes all day until this thing's done. Yeah, I noticed you put on social media the other day when you were giving Steve morphine. Don't move with this one. This is the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is the good stuff, big boy. Oh, dear. <laughs> The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, Odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work. Family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. In the early 1980s, a wave of fear with its origins in Canada swept across North America, igniting what would become known as the Satanic Panic. This moral hysteria, fueled by sensational media reports and dubious claims of widespread Satanic ritual abuse, had its roots in a controversial book published in 1980 titled, Michelle Remembers. As the panic spread, it manifested in several high-profile cases across North America. One of the most notorious incidents here in Canada occurred in Martinsville, Saskatchewan, where unfounded allegations of ritual abuse at a local daycare center led to multiple arrests and a community torn apart by suspicion and fear. 
other cases emerged, each feeding into the growing narrative of a vast underground network of satanic cults preying on innocent children. The episode of mass hysteria would leave a lasting impact on North American society, raising questions about the reliability of recovered memories, the power of suggestion, and the dangers of unchecked moral panics. This is Dark Poutine episode 340, Satanic Panic, a Canadian export. Canada is known for exporting a diverse range of products and cultural contributions that have impacted the world in meaningful ways. Canada has consistently been a major player in global trade from its vast natural resources such as timber, oil, and minerals to popular goods like maple syrup and hockey equipment. The country's cultural exports are also significant with internationally recognized musicians like Celine Dion and The Weeknd as well as iconic actors like Ryan Reynolds and Rachel McAdams. Beyond entertainment and industry, Canada has also exported intellectual contributions, medical innovations, and other inventions. Every time you eat a Hawaiian pizza or use a zipper, you should thank a Canadian. However, one of Canada's more controversial exports came in the form of a cultural phenomena in the 1980s, satanic panic. As we mentioned, this moral hysteria which spread through North America and beyond was fueled in large part by the 1980 book, Michelle Remembers, written by Canadian psychiatrist Lawrence Pazder and his patient Michelle Smith. The book claimed to deal with Smith's repressed memories of horrific satanic ritual abuse. Though later discredited, Michelle Remembers played a crucial role in igniting widespread fear of secret satanic cults contributing to the satanic panic movement that gripped Canada and the U.S. The cultural legacy of this moral panic rooted in a Canadian publication highlights how even a nation known for its modest and peaceful image can contribute to global waves of fear and paranoia. Paranoia! You know, isn't it funny how fear can travel faster than facts? Yeah. You know, uh, what started as this localized hysteria in Canada found, you know, very fertile ground in America and, and American sensationalism. Mm-hmm. Cause anything that Canada does, uh, America just does it with, with um, bright lights, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. And neon and all that kind of stuff. And of course, we can always count on the media to fan the flames, can't we? Yes, we can. Michelle Remembers purported to be an accurate account of Michelle Smith's recovered memories of horrific satanic abuse she allegedly endured as a child in Victoria, British Columbia. The book's lurid claims, despite lacking any corroborating evidence, captured the public imagination and sparked a continent-wide obsession with uncovering supposed satanic cults. That obsession continues today in some corners. According to the book, Michelle was subjected to unimaginable horrors at the hands of this cult, which included her mother. The narrative unfolds through a series of recovered memories unearthed during intensive therapy sessions with Dr. Pazder. Over 600 hours of therapy spanning 14 months, Michelle allegedly recalled vivid and disturbing experiences that had been wholly repressed until that point. The book paints a chilling picture of Michelle's childhood, claiming that her mother forced her to participate in the cult's dark rituals. The allegations are truly horrifying. Michelle describes being buried alive in a local cemetery, being forced to kill innocent animals, and witnessing the murder of adults and infants alike. The cult, according to Michelle's recovered memories, would even stage car crashes to cover up their gruesome deeds and evade law enforcement. But the claims in Michelle Remembers go beyond mere human evil. The book ventures into the realm of the supernatural, describing encounters with Satan himself during a massive ceremony called the Feast of the Beast, in a twist that seems more at home in a Hollywood blockbuster than a purported true story. Michelle also claims to have been visited by the Virgin Mary, who provided her with a divine plan to defeat Satan. Jesus and the Archangel Michael are said to have joined this cosmic battle, with the Virgin Mary ultimately removing Michelle's scars and memories of the abuse. 
What's really interesting to me here isn't just these sort of outlandish claims, but how plausible they seem to some people at the time, Mm -hmm. Um, because it's just so wacky. And, you know, the 80s, they weren't just a period of cultural shift. Um, And cocaine. And cocaine, but <laughs> but 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 there's a lot of psychological experimentation. This mm-hmm. whole this whole idea of recovered memories, right, yeah. B- becoming the latest fad. And the problem is, you know, these fads have real consequences. Yes, they definitely do. The media went wide with the story, preying on the fears of the public, in particular those of the evangelical Christians in North America. A quote from Pope Paul VI in Michelle Remembers from November of 1972 also spoke to Catholic readers. The pontiff said, quote, Evil is an effective agent, a living spiritual being perverted and perverting, a terrible reality. One of the greatest needs is defense from the evil which is called the devil. The question of the devil and the influence he can exert on individual persons as well as on communities, whole societies, or events is very important. It should be studied again, end quote. Remy de Roo, bishop of the Diocese of Victoria in B.C., made a direct quote about the book on September 28, 1977, quote, The Church is well aware of the existence of mysterious and evil forces in the world. Each person who has had an experience of evil imagines Satan in a slightly different way, but nobody knows precisely what this force of evil looks like. I do not question that for Michelle this experience was real. In time, we will know how much of it can be validated. It will require prolonged and careful study. In such mysterious matters, hasty conclusions could prove unwise. It may well be that for people today to hear this message coming from a five-year-old child is of particular significance, end quote. What do I say here? Of, of course the church isn't going to call bullshit on it because they always, like, this idea of Virgin Mary, as soon as that sort of, you know, uh, uh, brought up, they're like, they can't just poo-poo it, right, because they're, they're the church. And, yeah. it's, and it's terrible, Right, it's terrible because what what they're doing by not just saying no, absolutely not, it's, they're feeding into the hysteria, mm. and and let's call this what it is: either mental health issues on one side, or scam artistry on the other, or perhaps both. Right, and and someone sold a lot of books out of this and made a lot of money, and that's really what this book was about. I think I'll throw a third thing into the mix, and I think it's someone trying to do good but doesn't quite know how, and and maybe maybe that's what that's what led to this. Maybe. Lawrence Pazder and Michelle Smith both believed very strongly in what was happening. Yeah, you're going to be a lot more giving in this episode than me, <laughs> uh, which, which creates a, a, a good tension for the show. Yeah, right. Only years later, the book's claims were widely criticized and discredited. Many experts in psychology and psychiatry have raised concerns about the reliability of recovered memories and the methods used by Dr. Pazder in working with Michelle. There is no credible evidence to support the allegations of satanic ritual abuse in the book, and the book is now widely seen as a work of pseudoscience and sensationalism. By this time, however, it was far too late. The damage was done, and it was widespread. One famous case tied to satanic worship was that of David Berkowitz, also known as the Son of Sam. He terrorized New York City from 1976 to 1977 with a series of shootings that left six people dead and seven others wounded. Using a 44 caliber revolver, Berkowitz targeted young couples and women, often attacking them as they sat in parked cars. His reign of terror gripped the city in fear as he taunted police and the media with disturbing letters claiming to be driven by demonic forces. The killings began in July 1976 and continued through the summer of 1977. Berkowitz's victims included Donna Laria, Christine Freund, Virginia Voskarikian, Valentina Suriani, and Stacy Moskowitz, among others. He often struck in Queens, the Bronx, and Brooklyn, leaving residents across New York City in panic. The case garnered intense media coverage with Berkowitz reveling in the notoriety. After his arrest in August 1977, Berkowitz initially claimed that he had been compelled to kill by a demon-possessed dog belonging to his neighbor Sam Carr. This bizarre explanation and his letters referring to himself as the son of Sam fueled public fascination with the case. 
Berkowitz pleaded guilty to the murders and received multiple life sentences. However, in the years following his conviction, Berkowitz began to make new claims about the killings. He stated that he had been part of a satanic cult that orchestrated the murders as ritual killings. According to Berkowitz, he was not the sole perpetrator, but rather part of a satanic group of sons who carried out the attacks. He claimed to have been recruited into this cult at parties and gatherings in Yonkers, where he witnessed occult rituals and animal sacrifices. These allegations of satanic involvement sparked further investigation and conspiracy theories. Journalist Maury Terry became particularly invested in the idea of a wider conspiracy publishing a book called The Ultimate Evil that linked the Son of Sam killings to a network of satanic cults across the country. Terry's work suggested connections between Berkowitz and others, particularly John and Michael Carr, the sons of Berkowitz's neighbor, Sam Carr. You know, it, it's almost as if Satanism was the catch-all excuse for anything sure. unexplained or dark during this era. Yep. And, and, you know, there's this desperate search for an antagonist in society, and when it can't be found, it gets created. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in this case, Satan wasn't just a concept, he was the scapegoat goat for mental illness and crime and fear of the unknown and right. what what peeves me is that we had nailed the killer right but a people are listening to excuses from a serial killer and giving this loser credibility <laughs> right right just come on people and and b so-called journalists with little integrity are cashing in on it like mm -hmm. maury terry name one thing he was known for before or after this yeah i can't i can't and i looked it up there's nothing yeah yeah, this is kind of what he hung his hat on, that's for sure. Despite these claims, law enforcement largely dismissed the notion of a satanic conspiracy. Many viewed Berkowitz's new story as an attempt to shift blame or gain attention. While some investigators remained open to the possibility of accomplices, no concrete evidence has ever emerged to substantiate the claims of a widespread satanic cult involvement in the Son of Sam murders. The debate over Berkowitz's claims continues today with some true crime enthusiasts and conspiracy theorists maintaining that there is more to the case than the official narrative suggests. However, the general consensus among law enforcement and most experts is that Berkowitz acted alone in his killing spree and Satanism had nothing to do with the murders. In October 1988, good old Geraldo Rivera hosted a controversial two hour primetime television special titled Devil Worship, Exposing Satan's Underground. On NBC, the program aimed to investigate and expose an alleged widespread satanic underground in the United States, focusing on occult crimes, ritual murders, and the supposed dangers of Satanism. Geraldo Rivera yeah. makes me laugh. Uh, you, you can't you know, I can't believe people ever thought of him as a journalist. I think calling Geraldo Rivera a journalist is like calling a kid who hits a pinata a sculptor. No, right? dear. <laughs> like, like, sure, he makes lots of noise and breaks stuff, but you can't exactly trust him with something fragile and important or important like, say, the truth. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, Geraldo is an interesting cat. I, I mean, he's, again, he's somebody who tries, but I think he... It airs on the side of Geraldo, if you know what I mean. And so here's here's the dichotomy. Mm -hmm. he, trying for sensation is what he was trying for. Well, he's with Fox News now, and we know that they tell the truth every single time. So they actually said in depositions that they were entertainment. So there you go. There you go. So maybe they, <laughs> they are telling the truth then. <laughs> Geraldo's special began with a stark warning to viewers, cautioning that, the very young and impressionable definitely should not be watching this program tonight. Throughout the show, Rivera stood before a wall of television screens, each displaying the faces of individuals he would interview or discuss during the program. These included Sean Sellers, described as an all-American boy, awaiting execution on death row, Charles Gervais, serving a life sentence for a gruesome murder, and even rock star Ozzy Osbourne, dubbed the Prince of Darkness, for his controversial lyrics. Ozzy, known for his wacky antics, came off as probably the most sane and thoughtful character in the program. The special dug into a series of sensationalized and often outlandish claims about satanic activities across America. Rivera recounted tales of fathers wearing baby feet around their necks, 
and young killers drinking their victims' blood while heavy metal music played in the background. He devoted significant attention to white men who had allegedly committed murders in the name of Satan, including Charles Manson and the aforementioned David Berkowitz. Throughout the program, Rivera repeatedly emphasized the pervasive nature of the supposed satanic threat, claiming that no place in America is beyond the reach of devil worshippers. He suggested that these dark forces had infiltrated various aspects of American society from small-town churches and quiet suburban neighborhoods to the upper echelons of the military. The special particularly focused on the perceived danger to children, with Rivera highlighting the growing number of private daycare centers as potential hotbeds of satanic activity. The program featured a parade of guests claiming insider knowledge of these supposed satanic cults, but perhaps none were as chilling as the women who identified themselves as breeders for these cults. These individuals shared harrowing tales of captivity and abuse, describing a nightmarish world in which they were treated as little more than livestock by sinister cultists. According to their accounts, they were systematically impregnated and forced to give birth to babies destined for a gruesome fate, ritual sacrifice at the hands of Satan worshippers. The stories seemed to confirm the worst fears of those already convinced that satanic cults were a clear and present danger to society. The women spoke of underground networks, secret rituals, and a level of organized evil that seemed almost incomprehensible. Their testimonies painted a picture of a hidden world where the most innocent newborn infants were callously murdered to appease dark forces. However, as shocking as these claims were, they were met with skepticism from law enforcement and researchers. Despite extensive investigations, no physical evidence was ever found to corroborate the existence of these widespread satanic cults or the alleged mass sacrifices of infants. The lack of tangible proof cast doubt on the integrity of the breeder stories and other similar accounts that had increased during this period. As the 1990s progressed, experts and investigators critically examining these claims revealed their dubious origins. Many stories shared common elements influenced more by sensationalist media coverage and popular horror tropes than actual events. The concept of recovered memories, which had been used to substantiate many of these claims, came under intense scrutiny and was primarily discredited by mental health professionals. Today, Geraldo's Devil Worship special and the breeder testimonies it showcased are viewed as cautionary tales about the dangers of unchecked sensationalism in media. They underscore the need for rigorous fact-checking and the application of scientific skepticism when investigating claims of widespread conspiracy or hidden threats to society. The legacy of this period continues to influence discussions about moral panics, the reliability of eyewitness testimony, and the complex interplay between media, public perception, and social fears. The overall tone of Geraldo's special was decidedly alarmist, of course, contributing to the growing moral panic surrounding Satanism in the United States during the 1980s. Yeah, you, what, what Geraldo showed us, unfortunately, wasn't the extent of satanic cults, but the extent of many people's willingness to believe in monsters Yeah, uh, when they're sold it to them by somebody on the telly, right? Yep. And, and it's fascinating lesson in how media can manufacture reality in some people's heads. Yep. You know, the ratings that Geraldo got should be should have kind of been a warning to us that we should never have launched social media where, <laughs> where, where the feeble-minded get to talk to each other about the stupidest stuff. Well, we're we're a few of those feeble-minded people, though, Matthew. Yeah, but I think we should, you know, I love shit posting and bad memes, but you yeah. should have, you have to, you, there should be a breathalyzer on your phone to test your IQ before you're allowed to post anything. Oh, dear. <laughs> In the quiet coastal town of Manhattan Beach, California, a storm was brewing that would soon engulf North America in a frenzy of fear and accusation. It was August 1983 when Judy Johnson, a troubled mother with a history of mental illness, approached the police with a startling claim her two-and-a-half-year-old son had been molested by Ray Bucky, a teacher at the prestigious McMartin Preschool. This single allegation would ignite a firestorm that would rage for nearly a decade, leaving lives shattered and forever changing the landscape of child abuse investigations in North America. As news of the accusation spread, panic set in among the parents of McMartin students. 
the Manhattan Beach Police Department, in a move that would later be heavily criticized, sent out a letter to hundreds of families urging them to question their children about potential abuse. This action opened the floodgates, and soon a deluge of allegations poured in, each more fantastical than the last. Children, some as young as three, began to spin tales of underground tunnels, animal sacrifices, and dark rituals performed by their teachers. The case quickly became entangled with the growing satanic panic sweeping across the continent. Fears of widespread occult activity and ritualistic abuse had been simmering beneath the surface of American society and the McMartin case seemed to confirm these worst nightmares. Parents, therapists, and law enforcement officials alike became convinced that they had uncovered a vast conspiracy of evil lurking within their community. At the center of this maelstrom stood the Children's Institute International, CII, where hundreds of children were interviewed about their experiences at McMartin Preschool. Led by therapist Key McFarlane, the CII employed controversial techniques that would later be scrutinized for their suggestive nature. Children were encouraged to use anatomically correct dolls and were often praised for providing the right answers. As the interviews progressed, the allegations grew increasingly bizarre, with children claiming they had been forced to participate in satanic rituals, witness animal mutilations, and even travel through time. The media seized upon the sensational story, broadcasting lurid details far and wide. The McMartin case became a symbol of a hidden epidemic of child abuse, and similar accusations began to surface in communities across America. The preschool's founder, Virginia McMartin, her daughter, Peggy McMartin Bucky, grandson Ray Bucky, and four other teachers found themselves at the center of a modern-day witch hunt facing hundreds of charges of child abuse. You know, and this is a real shame here, this sort of moral panic. It victimizes mm. people. Instead of a focus on the one child who made the claim about the one adult and focusing a timely investigation, you know, mm. that would have better served the child if it were true or if the adult if it weren't. But right. in, instead, this panic and this sensationalism and this loss of truth ended up with this quagmire of everyone probably still suspecting on one side or the other, but the truth will never be known. No, and it's really, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that's what I see throughout this uh, whole episode is that maybe some kid, one kid is telling the truth and there's a mess of things that get uncovered because of this kind of nonsense. Buried. So, so maybe, maybe either that child's truth was buried or that, that, that um, man's truth was buried because of all this other stuff. Right? Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I meant to say anyway. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, I mean, yes, the poor people who are persecuted, but also that poor one kid that may have been telling the truth. Yeah. What followed was an unprecedented legal odyssey. The preliminary hearing lasted 18 months, becoming the longest in California history. When the case finally went to trial in 1987, it would stretch on for another three years, becoming the most protracted and most expensive criminal trial in American history. Despite the mountain of allegations, physical evidence was scarce, and the prosecution's case relied heavily on the testimony of young children, many of whom struggled to maintain consistent accounts on the witness stand. As the trial dragged on, public opinion began to shift. Questions arose about the validity of the children's testimony and the methods used to obtain it. The satanic panic that had fueled much of the hysteria began to wane, and a more critical eye was turned toward the investigation and prosecution of the case. In the end, no convictions were secured after seven years of legal battles. Peggy McMartin Bucky was acquitted on all counts while the jury deadlocked on charges against Ray Bucky. A second trial for Ray ended in a hung jury, and all remaining charges were eventually dropped. The defendants were free, but the ordeal had irrevocably altered their lives. When we come back from the break, you'll hear about another satanic panic case at home here in Canada. 
In this ad for the Mobile One brand, I have 30 seconds to talk about driving, which might be what you're doing right now. Maybe you're in the car, you're free, you're in control, on an open road with an open calendar. Your mind is wandering, and you're going with it. Or maybe you're stuck at work, in meetings, or emails, or worse, meetings about emails. And if that's the case, there's only one question. Why? Mobile One, for the love of driving. Visit loveofdriving.us slash radio to learn more. The Ford Explorer is America's all-time best-selling SUV. But we couldn't leave it at that. Because you still have unmarked paths to pursue. So we gave it an available 400 horsepower engine. It's up to you what you do with that power. The 2025 Ford Explorer. It's all in the name. Based on S&P Global Mobility 1946, the current U.S. total new cumulative registrations for all vehicles identified as SUVs. Horsepower and torque ratings based on premium fuel per SAHA 1349 standard. Your results may vary. We're halfway through, Matthew. Thoughts so far? Of course, this is one that's going to rile you up. I knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but I remember, I remember these days of the satanic panic, mm -hmm. right? And I had like some people who lived on my street who were like, stop their kids from listening to certain music because they believed if you played it backwards, it was satanic incantations. Mm -hmm. Like, like I experienced people who bought into this. Queen, if you play that backwards, another one bites the dust backwards, mm -hmm. uh, you will hear, it's fun to smoke marijuana. It's fun to smoke. Well, and I don't disagree. But that, that. that it isn't fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, yeah. Let's, let's, let's keep going. Yeah. Like the Manhattan Beach case, the Martinsville, Saskatchewan satanic panic began with a single disturbing allegation that would soon snowball into a nightmare for an entire community. In 1992, a mother came forward with a chilling claim. Her child had been sexually abused while under the care of a local woman running a home-based daycare service. This initial report, shocking as it was, would pale in comparison to the flood of accusations that followed. As investigators delved deeper into the case, the allegations became sinister and fantastical. The family at the center of the storm found themselves accused of not just isolated incidents of abuse, but of being key figures in a secret satanic cult known as the Brotherhood of the Ram. Children began to share horrifying tales of ritualized abuse that supposedly took place in a devil church, painting a picture of unimaginable cruelty and depravity. The various accusations grew increasingly extreme and bizarre. Children described being subjected to terrifying ordeals. They spoke of being drugged, suffocated, and suspended in cages. Some recounted being stuffed into freezers or forced to drink blood. Perhaps most disturbingly, many children alleged they were coerced into performing sexual acts as part of these satanic rituals. The investigators were told of a world of shadows and secrets where trusted adults transformed into monstrous abusers under the cover of occult practices. As the investigation spiraled outward, it began implicating others beyond the family that owned the daycare. Some children reported that their abusers sometimes wore police uniforms, a claim that sent shockwaves through the community and law enforcement alike. The web of conspiracy seemed to grow with each new testimony, suggesting a vast network of abusers that reached into the very institutions meant to protect the innocent. More than a dozen individuals were implicated, including five police officers from three different forces. Over 100 charges were filed related to the alleged satanic cult activities. The son of the daycare owner was tried and found guilty of molestation, but the evidence did not support the broader claims of widespread ritualized abuse. Amidst the more sensational claims, there were also allegations of more conventional abuse. Some children reported being asked to remove their clothes and being photographed in the nude, adding another layer of exploitation to the already horrifying narrative. These claims, while less fantastical than tales of satanic rituals, were no less disturbing in their implications of betrayal and abuse of trust. The case took a dramatic turn when a Royal Canadian Mounted Police Task Force took over the investigation. They concluded that the original inquiry had been driven by emotional hysteria rather than solid evidence. A critical review of the investigation revealed significant flaws in how the children were interviewed. 
The questions were found to be leading, and children were praised for providing incriminating answers, potentially influencing their testimonies. The aftermath of the Martinsville Satanic Panic was profound and long-lasting. In 2003, many of the falsely accused individuals sued for wrongful prosecution. Ron and Linda Sterling, two of the defendants, received a settlement of $924,000 in 2004. John Popowich, one of the five police officers wrongly accused, was awarded $1.3 million for a malicious prosecution. The Martinsville case serves as a stark reminder of the power of mass hysteria and the importance of proper investigative procedures, especially when dealing with vulnerable witnesses like children. It highlights how quickly fear and suspicion can spread through a community, leading to devastating consequences for those falsely accused. The events in Martinsville continue to be studied as a cautionary tale about the dangers of unchecked allegations and the need for careful, unbiased investigation in cases involving child abuse. Yeah, I mean, like you, like you said, Martinsville does stand out as a reminder of really how easily communities can devour themselves mm -hmm. when, when fear takes root. Like small communities devour themselves. Yeah. And what's really tragic here is how the very people meant to, to, to protect, law enforcement, parents, teachers, both became the victims and the perpetrators in this narrative. Right. And it, a, a narrative that has no basis in reality. So it's, it's just like everyone went bonkers. Yeah, completely yeah. insane. If you're looking for a deep dive into the Martinsville case, CBC's Uncover podcast dedicated the entirety of Season 6 to the case. The West Memphis 3 case is a tragic example of how the satanic panic of the 1980s and early 1990s influenced criminal investigations and led to wrongful convictions. In May 1993, three eight-year-old boys, Christopher Byers, Stevie Branch, and Michael Moore, were found murdered in West Memphis, Arkansas. The brutal nature of the crimes shocked the small community and led to intense pressure on law enforcement to solve the case quickly. From the outset, investigators believed the murders had cult overtones and may have been part of a satanic ritual. This assumption colored the entire investigation and led police to focus on local teenagers Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., known as the West Memphis Three. Eccles, in particular, drew suspicion due to his interest in occultism, black clothing, and nonconformist attitudes. So I'll jump in here. So I, I was aware of the satanic panic and its ridiculousness in the mid 80s when I was young. Yeah. And, and I have to say, I, I, I actually intentionally played with it by being a goth in a small town sure. just, just to raise the heckles of others. Yeah. Because, you know, it, I think maybe in some ways, Mike, I, I, I've thought of this perhaps me intentionally looking different and standing out before I really came out as gay was, was sort of a, a tester or something. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not sure mm -hmm. that that's sort of in the back of my head. And, but the truth is like, from day one, I always felt different and a bit of an outsider from many of the views in the, in, in my hometown at the time. Mm -hmm. And that being said, I'm sure Strathroy has changed and grown and the mindsets have changed and grown. So I'm not crapping on, on, on my old hometown. It was the, yeah. it, was, it was the thinking of the time, right? Cause uh, like I'm Facebook friends with a lot of people that still live there who are great open-minded people. Right? Sure. Um, but these moral panics, you know. You know, I'm very aware of them because it's usually us minorities that get it in the end. The gays, the Jews, the blacks, the First Nations. You know, we often get the brunt of um, of any sort of panics, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we've covered that in, in other episodes. So this is why I think in some ways, Mike, this is why I'm so out there in many ways. You know, I can do, I do camp it up sometimes. But, and, but it's it's kind of a, as an F you to all of this, right? Yeah. You know, you know, it's kind of like, come and get me, mofos, I'll take you on. Because, you know, I'm a strong person, I'm in a strong position in society in a lot of ways, right? I'm smart, I'm educated, I'm, I'm employed. But a lot of people uh, haven't had the luck that I've had in life. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if you're if you're poor or marginalized somewhere else and, and, you know, can't stand up for yourself. That's perhaps why, why I do it so much sometimes because yeah. I, I'm hoping to be a bit of an example and, and I don't know, it sounds ridiculous, but a bit of protector by just being out there and being who I am, hmm. um, with my voice. Right. 
There you go. Experts argued that Eccles was the ringleader of a satanic cult and that the murders were part of an occult ceremony. The prosecution relied heavily on Eccles' interest in Wicca and heavy metal music as evidence of his guilt, a coerced false confession from Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., who had an intellectual disability, provided the foundation for the case against the three teens. Although Miss Kelly's confession was filled with inaccuracies and he quickly recanted, it was used to arrest all three and was presented as evidence in Miss Kelly's trial. The media's sensationalized coverage of the alleged satanic elements further prejudiced the community against the defendants. Despite the lack of physical evidence connecting them to the crime, all three were convicted in 1994. Eccles was sentenced to death, while Baldwin and Miss Kelly received life sentences. The case gained national attention through documentaries like HBO's Paradise Lost series, which highlighted the flaws in the investigation and prosecution. You know, it's unsettling how much of a trial's outcome can hinge on a community's cultural biases. Uh, and that's what happened here, right? Eccles, mm -hmm. Eccles was convicted from... Just for, for being a weirdo. Well, for more, more for what he represented, a rebellious team with unpopular beliefs than for, for anything that he actually did. And, mm -hmm. you know, the 90s were way too quick to confuse nonconformity with danger, and we still are. Yeah. Over the following years, new evidence emerged that cast doubt on the convictions, including DNA testing that excluded the three men from the crime scene. In 2011, after 18 years in prison, the West Memphis Three were released under an Alford plea deal, which allowed them to maintain their innocence while acknowledging the prosecution had enough evidence for a conviction. However, the Innocence Project in the U.S. believes there is a way to prove that the three men are innocent. From the Innocence Project website, advances in DNA testing mean that today's tests are more sensitive. New techniques can successfully recover DNA from items, including porous materials like fabric, that could not previously be tested. In the case of the West Memphis Three, that means the shoelaces used to tie up the children who were killed could be tested. This testing could lead to the identification of the person or people who actually committed the crime. Damien Eccles has embraced the occult, his book, High Magic, a listener provided me with a signed copy, is a profoundly personal and instructive work that emerged from his harrowing experiences on death row. Sentenced to death at the age of 18 for a crime he did not commit, Eccles spent nearly two decades in prison, including 10 years in solitary confinement. During this time, he turned to the practice of high magic as a means of survival and spiritual growth. In the book, Damien Eccles shares the powerful spiritual techniques he credits with saving his life and helping him transcend his ordeal. He distinguishes high magic from low magic, explaining that the former focuses on self-development and spiritual growth, while the latter deals with manipulating one's environment. Eccles provides detailed instructions on various magical practices, including the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, which he describes as a fundamental technique in ceremonial magic. One of the unique aspects of high magic is Eccles' emphasis on the importance of intention and energy in magical work. He dedicates a chapter to explaining why spellbooks are ineffective, stressing the power lies in the practitioner's focused will and cultivated energy. This perspective sets the tone for the rest of the book, which delves into the deeper aspects of ceremonial magic beyond popular trends. Damien Eccles writes in a straightforward, accessible style, making complex concepts understandable to beginners while offering valuable insights for more experienced practitioners. He provides step-by-step -step instructions for various rituals and explains the theory behind them, offering readers a comprehensive understanding of the practices. Throughout the book, Eccles draws on his personal experiences demonstrating how these techniques helped him maintain his sanity and purpose during his imprisonment. High magic stands out in magical literature due to Eccles' unique background and perspective. His journey from death row inmate to spiritual teacher lends credibility to his teachings and offers a powerful testament to the transformative potential of magical practice. The book serves as a guide to high magic and an inspiring account of resilience and spiritual growth in the face of extreme adversity. Yeah, a death sentence would be definitely extremely adverse. Damien appears to have made lemons from lemonade. Yeah, and I think on a higher plane, uh, his story is a reminder of 
the human need to, for meaning, mm -hmm. es especially in times of extreme suffering. And he used the cultism a as a way to survive, uh, not escape reality. It's, and, and that's a distinction that makes this story all, all the more re remarkable to me. Yeah. Excluding the West Memphis Three, one of the problematic features in many of the allegations brought forward during the satanic panic epidemic is the controversial practice of recovered memories. Recovered memory therapy techniques, like those used by Lawrence Pazder with Michelle Smith, face several significant criticisms. Primary among them was that the methods used in recovered memory therapy were highly suggestive and could lead to the creation of false memories rather than the recovery of genuine repressed experiences. Research demonstrated that suggestive memory techniques could cause individuals to report memories from increasingly earlier ages, even before it was developmentally possible to form such memories. Critics argued that the concept of repressed memories, especially those of extreme trauma like satanic ritual abuse, lacked scientific evidence. The psychoanalytic notion of repression as an automatic defense mechanism that pushes traumatic memories into an inaccessible part of the mind was not supported by empirical evidence. Therapists were criticized for uncritically accepting the recovered memories as true without seeking external corroboration. This led to false allegations and, in some cases, wrongful convictions. The inability to distinguish between true and false memories without external evidence was a significant concern. Many of the methods employed to recover memories such as hypnosis, guided imagery, and dream interpretation were criticized for their potential to implant false memories. A favorite tool for some therapists, hypnotic regression, in particular, was identified as a powerful means of creating false memories. Critics pointed out that victims of genuine childhood sexual abuse typically have difficulty forgetting, not remembering their experiences. The focus on uncovering repressed memories was seen as misguided and potentially harmful. Some experts argued that recovered memory therapy had a high potential for harm and lacked therapeutic benefits for clients. The risk of false memory creation outweighed any potential advantages of the technique. The ethical implications of using suggestive techniques to recover potentially false memories, especially when these memories led to serious accusations and legal proceedings, were heavily criticized. Critics noted that many of the recovered memories seemed to be influenced by popular culture and fiction, rather than reflecting genuine experiences. This was particularly evident in cases like Michelle Remembers, where investigations failed to corroborate any of the book's claims. Sadly, the damage done by the satanic panic might have led some actual ritual abuse allegations to have fallen through the cracks. These claims cannot be dismissed out of hand and must be investigated case by case. Law enforcement and other agencies face a significant challenge in investigating ritual abuse claims requiring a careful balance of thoroughness and sensitivity. The key lies in adopting an evidence-based approach focusing on concrete physical evidence and employing careful interviewing techniques, especially with child victims. Collaboration with experts from various fields, including mental health professionals and forensic specialists, is crucial for comprehensively evaluating claims. Critical assessment of allegations is essential, with investigators needing to examine each claim's credibility, consistency, and plausibility. They must be alert to potential red flags indicating unfounded allegations while understanding the complexities of false memories and their possible origins. Throughout the process, maintaining a balance between skepticism and empathy is vital. Investigators should approach each case openly, support alleged victims, and maintain professionalism to avoid sensationalism. By employing these strategies, agencies can better distinguish between unfounded claims and genuine cases of abuse, ensuring justice for real victims while preventing wrongful convictions based on misinterpreted or false allegations. But what about Satanism? Isn't it evil? Actually, modern Satanism, as practiced by groups like the Satanic Temple, is primarily a non-theistic philosophical movement that uses Satan as a symbol of rebellion against religious authority rather than an actual deity to be worshipped. Contrary to popular misconceptions fostered by many during the Satanic Panic, Satanists do not engage in child sacrifice, ritual abuse, or any other criminal activities. Investigations by law enforcement, including the FBI, 
found no evidence to support allegations of widespread satanic ritual abuse. In fact, out of over 12,000 documented accusations of satanic ritual abuse in the United States, not a single case was substantiated. Modern satanic organizations such as the Satanic Temple focus on promoting secularism, individual liberty, and scientific rationalism. Their rituals and ceremonies, like the unbaptism ritual, are symbolic acts meant to reject religious indoctrination rather than supernatural practices. These groups often engage in political activism and community service, challenging religious privilege in public spaces and advocating for reproductive rights. Yeah, I think if anything, the satanic panic taught us how easily we can mistake symbols for reality. Mm -hmm. You know, modern Satanism, far from the monstrousness portrayed in the 80s, is actually rebellion against dogma and a statement about individuality. Sure. And ironically, it's it's more about freedom than it is about evil. And I actually think it's quite... I don't think it's about evil at all. I I think it's quite libertarian, in fact, right? And Mm -hmm. I think think the people that are involved with it... um, and calling it Satanism, are kind of doing it with a wry smile. Yeah, maybe. Aspects of Satanic Panic are still around today. QAnon has adopted similar tactics and narratives, spreading baseless claims about a global cabal of Satan-worshipping pedophiles. This modern incarnation of Satanic Panic has gained traction through social media and has even influenced some political discourse. The resurgence of these unfounded fears highlights the enduring power of conspiracy theories and moral panics in American culture. It reminds us of the potential consequences when such baseless accusations gain widespread acceptance, affecting individuals and communities and even shaping public policy. Yeah, and and in the end, panic never really dies; it just mutates. And no. you know, today's satanic p- panic may may wear a different mask. But the core, the core is the same. It's a yeah. fear of what we don't understand coupled with, and I think imp- importantly, coupled with the desire to control it. It's mm-hmm. about, it's about control, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Get your hands off of me. Get your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty <laughs> ape. <laughs> if you want to learn more, watch the Canadian documentary, Satan Wants You. I love this film. From their website, quote, Sean Horlor and Steve J. Adams are the directors, writers, and executive producers of Satan Wants You, a thrilling account of the extraordinary story that ignited the satanic panic of the 1980s. It premiered, it premiered at South by Southwest 2023 and won acclaim at festivals worldwide, including Best Documentary Awards at the Fantasia Film Festival and from the Vancouver Film Critics Circle. Their path to feature filmmaking began after an appearance on Out TV's Hot Pink Shorts reality series in 2012. They are proud members of the LGBTQ plus community. According to the Times Colonist newspaper, quote, During the editing of the film, a package arrived in the mail that would change the course of Satan Wants You, a 90-minute cassette tape. It featured audio from a 1976 therapy session between Lawrence Pazder and Michelle Smith, during which Smith is hypnotized. On the tape, Michelle Smith screams as if she's possessed by the devil. It's the only audio of their sessions known to exist, end quote. I highly recommend this film, so look for it and give it a watch. And that's it for this spooky offering of Dark Poutine episode 340, Satanic Panic, a Canadian export. Max Bankman, I'm the new doctor. Welcome aboard the Odyssey. ABC Thursdays. This ship is heaven. We're tending to our passenger streams. I'm in. From 911 executive producer Ryan Murphy comes a splashy new drama on a luxury cruise ship with Joshua Jackson and Don Johnson. It's your job to keep everyone alive. She's in VFIT. One, two, three. Clear. I have a pulse. You're going to be okay. Dr. Odyssey, Thursdays, 9, 8 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Whether you're making a delicious family meal or a post-workout snack, choose the farm fresh taste of Eggland's best eggs. Only Eggland's best hens are fed their proprietary all vegetarian feed. That's what makes their eggs more nutritious. With 10 times more vitamin E, 25% less saturated fat, and six times more vitamin D compared to ordinary eggs. Egglands Best. 
Better taste, better nutrition, better eggs. Visit egglandsbest.com to learn more. Discover Canada's most compelling true crime stories with True North True Crime. Join hosts Caitlin and Graham as they delve into gripping cases of murder and disappearance. My brother was such a huge light in everyone's life that he touched. Through in-depth research and exclusive family interviews, uncover the truth behind the headlines. I will never stop until I find out the truth. Until I'm six feet in the ground, I will never, ever stop. True North True Crime is available right now wherever you listen to podcasts. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Here's our first voicemail. Hello. I'm going to call myself out right now and say that uh, my first voicemail that you guys will hear, I don't know about the show, we'll hear and be, be hearing it, but... Uh, I definitely uh, stumbled on some words, panicked, and hung up, so I apologize for that. So I'm going to try it again. This is my second attempt. Uh, My name is Gabriel. Hello, Mike. Hello, Matthew. And hello, Steve. Uh, I live in Kelowna, B.C., but I'm born and raised in 100 Mile House, B.C., good old little town that has actually been mentioned a few times on your show, and that blew my mind every time I heard of it. I was like, wow, they know my town. Uh, There was a case there that happened a while ago that I'm going to put in your recommendation department. Uh, It was very tragic. A woman was attacked by a tiger in her own private zoo. And then about nine years later, her sister was murdered by her ex-boyfriend. Very tragic family story, but I'm going to save the details for the recommendation. Uh, also, today is October 1st, which means, I believe it means that, Mike, your new book is released. I uh, just wanted to say congratulations. Huge, huge step, huge accomplishment. And uh, also, you're like on TV and stuff right now. I haven't watched you on TV yet, but that's also really cool. But yeah, congratulations. I'm excited to read it. And uh, yeah. What else? I have. I felt like I had something else to say, but now I forget. So I'm not going to panic and hang up this time. I'm just going to say, go take a massive shit in your hat. I love you both, and thank you for the entertainment uh, that I get to listen to while I work. I shouldn't be doing it, but I do it because I love your show. Yes, that is all. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> that's great that he is had, great he had a little satanic panic and hung up the first time <laughs> that's right <laughs> so matthew what is the work that he is doing that he shouldn't be listening to the show uh well, well, whilst doing first of all gabriel is such a good name it really is it's such a good name gabriel carries some weight and some some it's some some heaven sentiness to it and that's and right hundred mile house is incredible have you been up there I have, yep. Yeah, because it's what you think Canada would uh, feel like if you didn't know what Canada was like. Yeah, yeah. You, you know what I mean? It's it's like all these trees. It used to be called Bridge Creek House because of the creek that's there. And did you, I don't know if you knew this, Mike, but it's it is the log home capital of North America. So I think I think Gabe, uh, sorry, Gabriel in Kelowna is um, building log homes. Building log homes. Oh. Okay, because you know if he if he's listening to the show and maybe you know gets caught under a, a like a landslide of logs or something, it could be bad. Go we'll take a log in your hat. Oh boy! <laughs> well, thanks for calling, Gabe. Much thank, appreciated. Thank I called you. you Gabe. I don't know if that's what you go by. I'm sure it is. <laughs> Everybody I know whose name is Gabriel goes by Gabe. And if not, it is now. Yeah, that's what that's what we're calling you. <laughs> Uh, Hi, let's Mike move on. We've got another. Obviously, Steve. Um, it's Sam calling from Pennsylvania. I've called a couple times before. I'm related to La Corriveau. Might end up killing someone if I follow family lineage. Who knows? Um, maybe be accused of witchcraft. But 
that's not why I'm calling. I have a very odd question for you. Um, recently, my fiance and I just went to the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair, and it was so much fun. We love it because we're huge nerds. Um, but I was wondering if in Canada you guys have anything like that, and if you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, please look it up so that you know what I'm talking about. Um, and if you do have stuff like that, is it popular? Do a lot of people go to it? Um, and if not, why not? We need to get the Renaissance Fair vibe up there to Canada for you guys. Okay, that's it. Thank you for everything you guys do. Love listening to the show. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Sammy Sam Sam, thank you for calling. Yes, well, there you go. Um, Yes, she's called before La Corriveau, the, the uh, widow Corriveau, who we talked about in an episode. But Ren Fairs, Matthew. Yes, of course we have Ren Fairs here. Do um, we? Yep, we, we do. Uh, I, I know some people who attend Ren Fairs. Um, of course you do. When they're, <laughs> hey. Your friends you know, are weirdos, Mike. You're one of them. <laughs> you're one of my weirdo friends. But This, this is true. But uh, yeah, I mean, yes, absolutely, it's a thing. I I personally haven't gone, but uh, you know, it's like people dressing up in uh, Renaissance costumes and those kind of things, and performing little skits and all that kind of stuff, and acting as though they were living in the Renaissance. One of my favorite memes online comes from uh, a Renaissance fair, and it's people dressed as uh, Star Trek cast members showing up at the Renaissance Fair. So it's like, oh, the, there's a Renaissance Fair on a planet that the uh, Enterprise has discovered. <laughs> and that's, so there's these anachronistic Star Trek folks. Wow, that's kind of meta, isn't it? Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. So Sam from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. She is the high Wic Wiccan priestess of the Seventh Order of Steve the Snorer. Okay, of course she is. Yeah. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 827 dark We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Okay, so we don't have any new patrons this week, but we do have a donut money donor. And that person's name is Tammy Kravit. And Tammy says, Mike and Matthew, here's some donut money for all the great work you do. Get something yummy for Steve, too, please. I tell all my podcast listening friends here in Phoenix, Arizona, about your show, even those who aren't from Canada. All the best, Tammy. Yeah, you don't have to be from Canada to enjoy a little helping a dark poutine, I don't think. I mean, so, we, our stories are compelling regardless of where you're from. Absolutely. And I, I know Tammy, and uh, mm -hmm. I know for a fact that Tammy is a Winnebago warrior. She's a Winnebago warrior. Okay. Brave as old John Wayne, true Yankee pioneer. Ah, uh -huh, there um, you have it. Yeah, so so that's that's her job now. She's just she's just traveling around, and I don't know if it's officially a Winnebago, but I'm going to say it's a Winnebago. Why not? <laughs> other camper vans um available yes other camper vans available um we also have uh another donut money donor one moment and that person's name is marie karaliuk and marie is from chilliwack british columbia and interestingly she says donut money coffee have you ever looked at local coffee out of Port Coquitlam, Spirit Bear Coffee Company? No, I have not, but now I'm going to check it out for sure, because it looks like an indigenous-owned business, and we're all about that. We can uh, definitely support some local folks. Marie, does she work for this uh, Spirit Bear Coffee Company, or is something else going on there? Yeah, but I, I think there's some something else beyond Spirit Bear. Okay, so right. she has a it's, hobby. Is she, yeah, so yeah, so her her hobby is um, uh, actually uh, training the spirit bears because you know you know the spirit bear, the white ones, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But she trains them to stay away from evil human beings. There you go. 
Oh, Steve is getting really loud. <laughs> <laughs> when we don't want him to, he yeah. does it. Yeah. Hey, Stevie boy. Hey, big boy. I know you're on that medicine. Wakey, wakey, big boy. Come on. <laughs> Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us Donut Money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for this episode of Dark Poutine. So until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye, everyone. You know the name. I'm Special Agent Gibbs. The most iconic special agent from TV's number one global franchise. NCIS. This fall, uncover his mysterious past. Let's go. And witness the untold story of how he rose from rookie to hero to legend. We're going to get the guy who did this. You have my word. Austin Stowell is. Special Agent Leroy Jeffo Gibbs. NCIS Origins. New series Mondays on Global. Stream on Stack TV.